Mideast Realities, a unique half hour highlighting the real Middle East. It is a program of information that government and media often misrepresent or just don't want you to know. Get the news without bias. Facts without distortion. And most importantly, analysis from the experts. With your host and chairman of the Committee on the Middle East, Mark Brzezanski. This program will feature an interview, discussion, or an event to help viewers understand the complex situation in today's Middle East, and especially the realities of U.S. policies toward that crucial region of the world. Mideast Realities. Welcome to Mideast Realities. I'm your host for this program, Mark Brzezanski, and thank you very much for tuning in. For the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing in detail the peace process, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, not from the macro perspective that most Americans usually uh, get information about the peace process, not from the top down, but rather from the bottom up. Things look very different if you're a Palestinian living in occupied Palestine rather than if you're an American watching it on C-SPAN and listening to the President of the United States uh, and Israeli officials and uh, Arafat uh, government officials talk about these things. Back in the occupied territories themselves, and I still use the word occupied territories because in many ways things are worse for the Palestinians now than before the peace process began, the situation is very different. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking with Omar Kura, who's a Palestinian graduate student living in the United States, and he's been helping with Mideast Realities for the past couple of years. And recently, um, during school break, he was home in Palestine, in occupied Palestine, in the city of Ramallah, where he uh, has been living for some 20 years. And uh, we've asked him to come back on the program this week to talk about some aspects of the Palestinian situation and the peace process, the quote-unquote peace process, that we haven't gotten to so far things like the diaspora Palestinians. In fact, more Palestinians live in exile outside of the occupied territories than live inside the autonomous occupied areas. Also, we haven't talked yet about Hamas, that movement that has grown up in the last decade in opposition to the more secular uh, and westernized Arafat regime. We also haven't talked about the covenant change, which is what uh, supposedly President uh, Clinton went to Gaza uh, not long ago to bring about. Um, and we haven't talked yet about the upcoming declaration of statehood, which supposedly is coming next year. So with that introduction, Omar, thank you again for uh, continuing this discussion. And which of these topics uh, would you like to take first? Uh, we could talk about the Palestinians in the diaspora. <coughs> um, many of these Palestinians uh, feel that they've been betrayed by Arafat and his authority for neglecting uh, their right of return or at least compensation. Um, during the Clinton visit to Gaza, the Palestinians in the camps in Lebanon have uh, r um, demonstrated against uh, uh, what they saw as the uh, covenant uh, change or we could what we could look at as Arafat's uh, uh, taking full control of the rights of the Palestinians in uh, determining what uh, covenant they want to go by. Uh, let's remember that the Palestinians in Lebanon and Syria uh, could not um, participate in the discussion of changing the charter. Uh, basically, it was staged uh, for Clinton to come and uh, witness the 
few Palestinians Arafat was able to gather and uh, to change the well, charter. Well, you know, Omar, while you were over there, of course, I was watching things on the international news where, where other than Mideast realities for a half hour a week, uh, CNN is what we, we all uh, are forced to watch. And the irony of the, of the situation, the incongruity of the situation became so startling to me. Here was Bibi Netanyahu saying the Palestinians have finally met and the covenant's been changed. The President of the United States, of course, Hanan Ashrawi, Edward Said, here are these moderate Palestinians saying there's no meeting of the, of the Palestine National. This is not a meeting of the Palestine National Council and nothing's being changed. So you've got the enemies of the Palestinians saying that they've held a meeting and changed something and then the moderate Palestinians, not to mention the people you mentioned, are saying, no, that wasn't a meeting of the PNC, and no, no charter was changed. Now, you arrived in Ramallah a few days after the president left. That yes. was your, your, your break. Did the Palest How does the average thoughtful Palestinian see what has just happened? Uh, well, uh, a feeling of uh, helplessness and uh, uh, no, basically most Palestinians are just not interested, they're sick of politics, uh, uh, they're going about uh, making a living, uh, there's a great sense of despair, uh, the social atmosphere is sort of poisoned, um, there's a lot of suspicion between the Palestinians. Um, uh, I saw a distinction between the Palestinians who uh, were living in Ramallah and those who came with Arafat, um, Arafat's authority, uh, there's a sense of loathing uh, that these people have uh, brought in corruption with them to Palestine. Okay, but back to the diaspora Palestinians then. Um, maybe this is all part of the, of the peace process. All these terms, bypass roads, autonomy, uh, 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 statehood, charter change, PNC, nobody can even agree anymore on what the terminology is. Right. Now, you were talking about the diaspora Palestinians. I think it's about an equal number that live outside of Palestine in exile, but all of these families, or almost all of these families, started inside the boundaries of today's Palestine, and they were expelled in either the 48 war or the 67 war. I mean, is that generally the situation? That's true. And about how many would you estimate there are, and are and what percentage of those are still in refugee camps? Um, I would say there is about four million Palestinians outside Palestine. Uh, I think we could say that... Uh, four million outside? There's Palestine? only two million inside. Uh, well, counting the Israeli Palestinians, I guess two and a half. Two or more. I think we would get to three Close million. To three. All right. three. And you would estimate four million mm -hmm. live outside. Yeah, uh, there's a number in Jordan. Um, and Palestinians who are refugees uh, don't, don't have to be living in refugee camps. Some have uh, basically settled in places like Jordan, but they're, uh, I think they're considered by the United Nations as refugees. But a large number of that four million still do live in camps, don't they? I mean, I, I'd rather have you estimate, and I'll give you my estimate. Uh, I, I'm coming up with a number, but... I think uh, there's a large number in Lebanon who still live in camps. Uh, there's about... 250,000 to 350,000 who still live in Lebanon and these um, undergo um, discriminatory treatment by the Lebanese government. Um, they're denied uh, jobs uh, and they're forced to do menial jobs in order to survive. Well, the Lebanese have their own reasons and problems and then a few hundred thousand at least must live in Syria. Syria indeed. And there are some refugee camps there still. Yes, yes. And, uh, and then the largest number is in Jordan, and probably 60-70% of the, of the Jordanian population is uh, are Palestine. exile Palestinians. Indeed. Um, and if I had to guess, and it's, it, this is not something I've looked into recently, maybe a third of the Palestinians in Jordan are still in camps? Um, I'm not sure of the figure, but we could assume it is... Okay, you got some that. large refugee camps still in in Jordan. So these people aren't even part of the discussion, right? Um, and you say that during the, the the last months there have been demonstrations and and riots, or 
even I, who try to follow these things, have heard very little about this. Right. So what did you hear? Uh, well, I've heard, uh, I've read in Edward Said's article, uh, a recent article, that Palestinians in Lebanon and Syria have demonstrated. Uh, we could assume that uh, they've uh, been given permission to uh, demonstrate. I don't think in Jordan the Jordanian regime have allowed Palestinians there to express their uh, resentment of what's happening. I assume Jordan wants to appear as pro the peace process and uh, doesn't want to allow any dissent to uh, emerge from the Palestinian camps there. Mm -hmm. So that's the diaspora Palestinians, uh, not only demoralized, uh, but we hear very little. We hear very little about them now. Hamas. I know, of course, you're a secular person of Christian background, um, so you may not have uh, a lot of personal friends that are in Hamas. But I've heard that um, Hamas is a very popular movement. People are afraid to express their involvement with it, but that. It's it's actually quite popular that that people are hoping someday that there will be a different leadership than the Arafat leadership. Uh, indeed, uh, I've noticed that um, Hamas's material, uh, tapes, and perhaps uh, newspapers that are uh, that express Hamas's point of view are um, uh, in circulation. People, um, I think there's a good number of people who follow up and are interested with what the Hamas people have to say. Um, I think the other groups uh, have uh, much less of a following than Hamas. Who? The PFLP or... And That's the sort of the intellectual left? Yes, yes. Um, What's left of the socialist left? <laughs> <laughs> uh, In this capitalist age. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, but Hamas itself, um, is it an alternative leadership for the Palestinians as Hamas people uh, and and you'll remember on this program we interviewed from his prison cell in New York City uh, Musa Abu Marzuk the political leader of uh, Hamas who was then deported to Jordan when the Israelis uh, decided they didn't want to bring him back after all mm -hmm. um, I found him a very interesting and dignified uh, man um, is there the thought among Palestinians that Hamas is an alternative for the future? Um, I couldn't tell from talking to Palestinians in places like Ramallah or Bethlehem, uh, but I would assume in Gaza there's a much greater support for Hamas. Uh, Hamas seems to have uh, offices outside Palestine in Jordan or in Iran, and uh, I, I they give uh, public statements about uh, Hamas's position and its opposition to the authority, and people seem to follow up on that. Well, it'll be very interesting to see, in fact, with uh, Israeli elections upcoming, whether Hamas does what it did the last time uh, and uses violence as a political tool. Um, the discussion of the, of the legitimacy of that violence and the reasons for that violence is beyond what we're going to get into today, but um, I, I, you know, I'm a secular person myself, but when I have met with Hamas people, including Abu Marzuk in his New York jail cell, I have found them remarkably dignified and remarkably articulate, remarkably principled, rather naive at times uh, beyond their own circles. But um, would any of us be all that surprised if one day the Arafat regime sort of crumbled of its own ineptitude and the vacuum would be filled by Hamas. There's nobody else, is there? Um, I don't think so. Uh, the um, other groups that have existed traditionally on the Palestinian scene uh, don't seem to be cre uh, in the process of creating an alternative. Perhaps Hamas is preparing for a day when it might take over. Perhaps in places as in Gaza, they're creating underground um, um, uh, grassroots support. Mm -hmm. But um, there's I sure a major effort to quash them, cut off their funding, and push them under. I mean, and usually when a major effort is made of that kind, it's because a group has a lot of grassroots support and a lot of sympathy. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Okay, last but crucial subject. May 1999 is supposed to be the Declaration of Statehood. Of course, we all 
those of us who follow these things remember that Arafat declared statehood in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> He's been making the, he, he seems to, uh, you know, uh, hold out these uh, um, hopeful signs uh, as his way of keeping himself uh, in power. But nevertheless, this time it's a little bit different because this time we're talking about um, autonomous population centers that are actually controlled by Palestinian uh, police, even if they are surrounded by the Israeli army. Now, you were just there. There must have been talk about what's coming in 1999 and statehood. Uh, people who I've spoken to uh, did not seem to care about that. Uh, they. Uh, Hamas people uh, who have statements before said, uh, so what, he declared it 10 years ago, <laughs> what difference get, does it going to make? Um, I, don't th I think, uh, depending on the political situation, then uh, Arafat may declare it, and Netanyahu might close off the autonomous regions, and then he'll say, that's all what we're going to give you, we're not going to give you anything else. And I've read that the Israeli army is preparing for a military operation in, or, um, in case uh, there's violence from the Palestinian police against the Israeli army. Uh, I think that might happen in some areas, but not all areas. But I would have thought, I mean, the idea that the Palestinians, after all this time, would declare a statehood and that the majority of the nations in the world would recognize this statehood is what you're saying to me I don't want to put words in your mouth here but is what you're saying to me is that this might matter to the diplomats but people on the ground realize not much is going to change whatever which way whichever <laughs> way it goes no I indeed uh, I think uh, th w what uh, what the Palestinians are going to get of a state are the symbols and images of a state they currently have uh, travel documents that are called passports and they have ministries all over the place and uh, ministers uh, take, uh, running things but um, the real situation on the ground is that the Israeli army has the upper hand and uh, it, it's the economic situation just keeps, keeps getting worse and worse in most of the Palestinian areas um, I don't see what difference declaring a state is going to make. All right. Well, it's not just that. It's when you take a look at the map of the area, and I think we, we may have that map, um, you can declare a state, but if you don't control the territory of that state, and if your people are bottled up on reservations or bantustans, and if another foreign army is, is all over the place, not to mention not shown on this map, but 150 Israeli settlements with bypass roads literally dot all of the Palestinian areas, even in Gaza, which the world talks about as if it's Palestinian, 37 percent of Gaza continues to be controlled by Israeli settlements, plus of course the electrified fence surrounds the place, Gaza ghetto, Gaza prison, we've talked about that before. Um, and if I'm extrapolating from what you're saying, uh, people say big deal. Arafat's talking about it, but it isn't going to change anything for us. Indeed. So it's all sort of a fictional por portrait of um, the regimes in that part of the world can say, we got the Palestinians a state. Mm -hmm. And the Americans can say, we're even handed. For the Palestinians themselves, as you said in an earlier part of this discussion uh, in a previous program, life and conditions are considerably worse under the current peace process than they were when you were younger growing up under the intifada situation but but elaborate on that uh, basically it's more chaotic uh, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority makes new rules and imposes new regulations every day and people uh, cannot seem to keep up with it. Um, I'll give you an example of how uh, Palestinian Authority officials um, basically uh, go into businesses that are already established and basically become partners with uh, business owner uh, by force and uh, they become uh, uh, people who make profits basically out of the Palestinians 
in the West Bank. So there's a sense so of loathing. So mafio mafioso tactics? Or? Indeed, uh, more of a thuggish manner. Um, the we used to call it protection money. Uh, protecting <laughs> from us. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, as we say in Arabic, khawa. Well, I mean, because what, what do they use? What are the tactics they use? You say they go into these businesses and become parts of these businesses. I'm assuming the people who own the businesses and have made them successful don't just hand the businesses over. There must be some coercion well, involved. There's the power of the different police uh, forces. And uh, m some of these police forces are under no control. They just uh, um, uh, operate on their own. Uh, in places like Hebron, I've heard that uh, some Palestinian police uh, basically kidnaps business owners, beat them up, impose a, a f uh, high tax on them, and then let them go when they pay it. Uh, and uh, another um, crucial fact to remember is um, the Palestinian Authority uh, allows only one importer for a certain item, and basically the major items are owned uh, or the basically the ability to import uh, certain items like gas or wheat or sugar um, you would find there are ministers or people affiliated with the ministers and Palestinian Authority officials that are behind these uh, enterprises and uh, prices are basically more expensive than they used to be well it's the old formula you do what you're told you cooperate with the occupier in this case the Israelis and the Americans, and you get rewarded, and uh, you get travel documents, and you get to import this or that, and uh, if you don't cooperate, you uh, don't get papers to leave Gaza Ghetto, and uh, you get a lot worse than that. I mean, visits in the middle of the night and uh, taken off to prison. We know there's a lot of torture that goes on in these mm -hmm. Palestinian prisons. Well, you know, Rabin had said it. Uh, uh, he had said he was going to break the bones of the Palestinians when he was... Everybody wants to forget that Rabin was the defense minister for Shamir, who, when the Intifada began, said very clearly, I'm going to break their bones and crush them. Mm -hmm. um, a few years later, he signed the Oslo Agreement. I don't really think he changed. I think he thought this was the way to continue the policies he had spent most of his life pursuing. Mm -hmm. But he's been rewarded by American uh, history professors and uh, some of the people I've known over the years who profess to be academics but who are sort of academics on the take um, with this image that all of a sudden he changed his stripes and became a, a big peacemaker. The situation you've described, Omar, is uh, pretty sad. Um, but also, to give the oppressors credit, maybe they've designed something that's going to work. I mean, maybe this is going to disenfranchise the Palestinians um, in real time. It's demoralized them, confused them, bewildered them. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to work or is it going to crumble? Uh, I think for the coming uh, few years it might hold. Uh, there will be more confusion, more despair, more diplomatic initiatives, more riots. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know how much longer it may hold. Uh, there is definitely going to be more unrest. Um, I think at one point people will just realize that they've been taken for a ride, that they need to take things in their own hand. And uh, when that happens, they'll have uh, deadlier weapons at their disposal. Uh, more than the stones they've used before, and that might uh, spark a civil war among the Palestinians. Since well, that'll just play into Israel's hands. Indeed. But when you say taken for a ride, this reminds me a couple of years ago I was uh, in Egypt, and I used to go to Egypt a lot. I've been there many, many, many times. And in fact, as you know, back in the late 70s when I was just a student, I arranged with Anwar Sadat to send the first telegram ever sent to Israel at the beginning of this extended peace process. And anyway, I arrived there on a New Year's Eve and I picked up the phone and I called uh, Mohammed Sid Ahmed, you know, the famous uh, writer, and his wife answered the phone and Mesa, the first thing she said to me was, Mark, where have you been? You haven't been here for a long time. We've all been had, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> and then she invited me over for uh, cocktails on uh, New Year's Eve. 
I'm afraid we all have been had, and the peace process is so terribly uh, misrepresented in the United States. There are so many institutions, personalities, um, who have a vested interest in portraying the so-called peace process as something it is not, and in keeping the realities of the peace process from, from being widely known. And that's among the reasons we, of course, have this pro uh, program, Mideast Realities. I'm your host for the program, Mark Brzezanski. And thank you very much for watching. We hope you'll tune in next week uh, and watch our program again. For the past couple of weeks, with the help of uh, Omar Kura, Palestinian graduate student here in the U.S., who has recently been home to see for himself what's happening in Palestine. But actually, I know you went home to visit family and, and relatives. Um, with his help, we have been able to look at the actual realities, the micro-realities of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. They're not very pleasant. They're uh, not very hopeful either. But uh, we, we cover many subjects with this program. And uh, in the interim, between now and next week, please also take a look at our website, www.middleeast.org. We've worked quite hard to improve the site, to add a lot of uh, new features to it. There are many articles uh, giving a lot of details about what's really happening. And we even have some clips from this program. And with the help and support of those of you who watch the program, we'd like to put this program on weekly. I'm Mark Brzezanski, your host.